Hello and welcome to the news from the real world. We will be covering the week of March 30th. I'm Jess and I'm a stage and production management major. I'm Akiva, I'm a media design major. I'm Lindsay, I'm a stage and production management major. And I'm Simone and I'm a technical director. Okay, great. So we're going to start off by talking about uh, the best and most influential special effects in recent film history. Uh, this was the video with all the little clips. What do you guys think about that? I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, I really liked, it was, it was a key flashback to some pretty awesome stuff. I think some people were more interested in it than others. I know you didn't express like, because like it was inspiring for some people, but. Yeah, I think like, a lot of people in the comments were talking about how they were really inspired by the video and I thought it was interesting how a lot of the people I noticed that were commenting were people that I know are interested in film, um, and they felt like this video really defended their interests in film. I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if it necessarily like needed defending, but um, I thought it was, yeah, it's cool to think about what they can do in film and what we can still do in, in theater and how the, the theatrical special effects are also becoming like way, way cooler as time goes on, like, as films, like, shooting up here at theaters, like, also heading up there. It'd be really interesting to see a similar video that compiled theatrical effects over the decades and see how those have changed. I mean, it's a lot harder because theater isn't yeah. filmed all the time, and yeah, obviously one person can't have seen all of these pieces of theater. Like, mm -hmm. one person could easily have seen all of those films. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be a really interesting experience. I also just think it brings up kind of a larger dialogue about the role of theater versus the role of film and how traditionally we've seen, or like thinking back to when film suddenly started being able to like talk and how all of a sudden theater tried to do all this crazy meta theatrical stuff because they couldn't compete with the realism of film. So it's sort of interesting how this kind of brings it all together because now that film is not only doing realism so well, but like over realism and making up mm -hmm. new realism, which is something that I think theater has tried to like hold on to with the imagination. So yeah. I'm interested to see where this all goes. I, mean, I think that brings up a really interesting point because something that I was thinking about when I watched the video is that in film, I often find that those crazy special effects bring me into it more, but in theater when there are, if those same special effects were applied to theater, it would almost take me out of it a little bit, uh, just because theater is more real and it's there. It's so much more personal. Yeah. Like, I know, like I mean, yeah, I feel like, because I saw A Woman in Black, which is a two-person show in London, and it was absolutely amazing, and I love one-man and two-man shows and sort of, like, that simplicity, because my imagination just totally takes over, and that's something that is lacking more and more in movies, where it's, like, they're, like, feeding you all of, like, what happened, you know, like all of the effects and like what happens and so like it's, it's, my mind is more shut off, especially with like a lot of more effects, you're like, whoa, that's cool, that's cool, and it's sort of not really bringing into the world of it, like, um, there was another article a few weeks ago about, um, that they're bringing King Kong to mm -hmm. like Broadway, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 Uh, and so I'm just thinking like, seeing a, what is 30, 50 foot? Yeah, giant. Gorilla on yeah. stage, like no way in hell would I be paying attention to anything else. Yeah. yeah. But I think the potential there to bring it beyond just a gorilla on stage is really exciting. And I'm actually like, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear more about King Kong because I think it could very easily fall into the trap of, well, why didn't you just make a movie if it's so exciting? And then, but I, I don't it's know. Crazy fact. It has the yeah. potential to push beyond. Ultimately, I think special effects are always just going to be a tool. Uh, a lot of older films, like really early days in films, were surrounded with special effects. I mean, they realized they could do these almost magic tricks using uh, film and cameras, and that led to some really interesting storytelling. But when I watched that video and saw all those films, I had seen like a third, maybe a half of them, and I only really remembered and was like inspired by, like you said, some people commented, that they were inspired. Um, I was only inspired by the films that were good films, not had amazing special effects, but like they had other good elements. They were good stories. And so 
you, in theater or in film, it's about what we want to do with those special effects, not just the effect itself. Yeah. From a technical perspective, though, there's a lot of interesting um, knowledge that goes into making special effects. Uh, so, uh, the next article that we're going to talk about was the uh, time travel through set design. And this was the article that went through the set design of Triangle, uh, which goes through multiple decades, Times um, goes sometime in the 1900s to 2011. Um, I think it goes from 1914. 19, yeah. I think it's 1910, 1911, and 2011. And so it's all, and it also goes from like a factory to like a synagogue, and then a, di a third location. Yeah. So for the most part, uh, a lot of the comments, everyone was really into the changes that they saw from picture to pi picture of the set. Um, Hunter Modisette, however, commented that uh, he thought it was a fairly cool set design, and uh, it manages to portray lots of the of the locations with the many set pieces. But he didn't feel like, he didn't see that traveling through time. And I have to say that I agree with him on that. Um, I thought it was really cool how the different set pieces transformed to tell you that you were in a different place, but I didn't necessarily know what place that was in time. I think some of that might come from the translation that has happened from a stage play to, well, I guess it really started in the model form, but then it, it went to that stage play. And so maybe watching the show will give you that sense of time travel. I didn't particularly get it from these images as well, although I do think it's a really nice set. Yeah, I totally agree. I think I think this is also where costumes will pick mm -hmm. up a lot of the slack um, when it comes to time travel. I, yeah, I didn't see anything particularly amazing, but it does do a really great job with uh, the location changes. I think it's always a struggle. And I think also it's important to note that this was an article put out by a theater company or by a production company about a show that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So it's meant to be an audience outreach marketing article. So, and I think actually the cool thing for us as theater practitioners is the pictures that they show are all pictures of the model. And I think they're, they're really excellent. They did a really great job of taking a picture of the model and making the scale feel like from the picture real size or real stage. So I think for us, that's sort of the thing we could get out of it. But yeah, it, I mean, it moves between time and place, but I, I don't know, I guess maybe I'm a little bit of a cynic and think that like, that's one of the strengths that theater should be able to do. Because- I really agree, yeah, I'm curious how this actually translated yeah. or translates to the stage, but yeah, I'm kind of the same, so at least I'm I mean, I, I quite like dynamic sets, be it traveling time or space or something else. And I think that this is a really nice dynamic set. And I think that the model that they've made is a really good tool for showing that dynamicness. A, a yeah. ground plan just doesn't do a sure. dynamic set in nearly the same way. And so I think it's a really powerful tool that we don't think of enough. And maybe because we don't think of using a model dynamically, we don't think of using sets dynamically when mm -hmm. maybe we yeah, I I agree with that actually. I never really thought of like what a ground plan does to such sets like that. Because showing movements on a ground plan is like is just not it's, it's really yeah. hard and it's really hard to imagine from that. Yeah, and, and yeah. From a stage management perspective, having this sort of tool is really invalu invaluable because right. when you're when you're looking at a ground plan, you could sort of vi visualize how the thing moves, right. but having this is in your face and it just shows you how it moves. And if you can come up with a document um, like this one that looks really realistic to what the stage will look like in the end, that's really helpful for not just management, but the other designers and everyone Good on the team. Well, and even yeah. the actors, just like understanding that this tape on the floor is actually going to be a wall is a little bit easier when you see a teeny tiny wall that is a physical thing rather than just invisible wall. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Right, right. Okay. Uh, so next we're going to talk about the very exciting using infants in a doll's house. Oh, so many <laughs> things to say. So many <laughs> things. We get very excited about that. <laughs> uh, so I've been saying that 
with this article. As a manager, I hate it. As an audience member, I love it. Um, what do you guys think? Well, tell us what you mean by that. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> as a manager, I could just... So they told a story in the article about how uh, one time, five seconds before the baby was supposed to go on stage, the baby started screaming, and then moments after, the baby vomited all over his mother. Um, so they had a doll. So basically, so Brooklyn Academy of Music, I don't know if it's ended at this point, but they had a production of A Doll's House that cast like a real live baby. Um, but they also, didn't they have a doll? Or yeah, something? so they had a doll that was a backup, just in case something went wrong with the baby. And like they were monitoring the baby, so they were like, yeah, if the baby is, is acting weird, up until the moments when they're supposed to go on. We're going to not have the baby go on, and we're going to have a doll go on instead. So this particular time, the baby was acting fine, and then all of a sudden, five seconds before the baby was supposed to go on, the baby started screaming and then vomited on his mother. And luckily, they had the doll there, and the doll was able to go on. Oh, um, my God. But if, like, could you imagine if that happened on stage? Um, and there's an argument there that it could be, it could lead to a more authentic, uh, like, acting experience for the actors, and it could look more realistic. But I think there's a difference between maybe a baby like cooing or crying a little bit on stage, and a baby vomiting on you as an actor. Um, I think that can really take you out of it. Um, and just from a, <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. from a management perspective, it's just like you have enough to deal with, right. and usually you don't want to have to deal with a real human that can't speak to you because mm -hmm. you're used to be you're used to people at people. least being able to speak to you. Um, but as an audience member, I love it because I think that it's like kind of exciting that they're using it's a risk and I like risk as an audience member. So I hate to draw parallels between baby humans and animals, but I'm gonna. Uh, yes. Bringing, <laughs> bringing animals on stage lends uh, all the same problems to your production. I mean, if you have a dog in your production and then it decides it needs to go bark at somebody's feet for the whole scene, like, there's not a lot you can do about it. It's on stage at that point. You can't pull it off and bring in the stuffed animal. Uh, and it's sort of an interesting thing because a lot of times directors and a whole production team will want to have a very tight control over what goes on stage and what the audience will ultimately see. And in all of our design classes here at CMU, we're taught to really consider every little detail down to the type of glue you use in, just in case the audience is able to see it. And so it, it is a big risk to put some sort of animal or baby on stage that you're not going to have that control over and you just have to hope that things work out. So I'm going to be the dissenter here. I think that having the baby on stage is a really quick and dirty way to get an immediate emotional response from an audience. And it feels like a gimmick to me. It's like that. It's like Sandy the dog and Annie where like everyone says aww when Sandy runs across the stage and Annie and so yeah I feel like if you have to depend on a real tiny live human to convey a heightened emotional response from your audience, then you're sort of taking you're taking a lot of the responsibility, maybe not responsibility, but you're taking a lot of the like abil or opportunity for the other actors to who like can speak and will remember this to provide a similar sort of response. And the director made a comment, uh, where is it? The director said that the baby, that they cast a real baby to make the stakes of Nora's decision to leave the family home possibly forever as vivid as possible. But like, I think you end up with a bit of a mixed message because although that is sort of the big uh, ending of the show, spoilers, yeah. uh, and I think it does make it more poignant. I think just knowing that she has a baby does that, and I don't think me having gone, ooh, ah, that's right. such a cute baby in the first act really makes that much of a difference. I totally agree. Like, I don't, I don't know. I think that babies, like, full nudity, a lot of the stuff is just, not to compare the two, um, <laughs> is such a, it's just a distraction and a gimmick. Um, I think that they should, yeah, they shouldn't need a live baby in it 
and they, like referring to the audience, there comes a point where they know they're seeing a show. Like it's not right. There's no like illusion here. If you don't need, you can have a fake baby, and they will still responding like, okay, this is supposed to be a real baby. What right? the in, the interesting thing about that though was they had kind of two quotes from different groups of people in the article, and the younger there was like a group of like school children who saw it, and a seventy five year old woman, and the school children said, oh, it was great that it was a real baby. It'd be really freaking distracting if it was like a fake. And then the 75-year-old woman was like, why didn't they just have a doll? I was distracted, and I was afraid the baby was going to start crying the whole time. Yeah, I was, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm with the 70-year-old woman. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, we're, I guess we're just a curmudgeon type group I've of seen, people. But I've seen productions that use dolls when they really should have had real versions of whatever it was, and it has been distracting to me. Right. But I've also seen versions, uh, plays, where they have used a real thing, and they should have used a doll. Right. So I, I can see both sides of that. I was going to bring up like Christmas pageants mm -hmm. where like sometimes the baby Jesus is like the pastor's kid, but yeah. in <laughs> present company, Small I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that right? too. I just haven't personally experienced it. Yeah. I think that Akiva's right. And I think it's sort of, it's a decision that needs to be made based on what you're going for with the show. Um, something that I was thinking about is if you view the use of like infants and, and pets or even nudity as kind of like a special effect. So what we were talking about right. before with the first article, um, I can almost see those as special effects. Um, and in that case, they can be exciting. And, they can, and, and, I, and I don't think that they have to take the audience out of the world if they're done correctly. It's just that the baby is an interesting case because it's so uncontrollable. Right. I think even a dog is probably more controllable, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, because it's then it's you get the special train. dog, and yeah, you have the you dog handler. It's trained, it's not like yeah, it. although they did yeah. say in the article that the baby seemed almost a little bit trained. Like, the well, mother, the, the one mother was, was like saying, uh, the baby, <laughs> cool, right? he, the mother was talking about their child, and they were saying how he's very focused when he's on stage, and he, like, feels the energy of the people watching him. Right. Um, <laughs> and, just, and I don't know if I buy into that's that. That's a big load of blank. Like, <laughs> <laughs> let's be real here. Yeah. yeah, I'm not so sure if I buy into that. Right. Um, yeah. But who knows, maybe it's some it's superstar baby that's yeah. Benjamin Button. What if it's gonna, really an elderly person? But let's let's move on. Curious <laughs> case of Benjamin. Anyway. Anyone else have anything to say about babies? Nope. Uh, uh, all right. So moving on from exciting topic to exciting topic, we're now going to talk about grass printers. Um, what a topic! This, this was actually controversial before we turn on yeah. the camera. Yeah. Like, yeah. So <laughs> half of the com actually the majority of the com commenters thought that this was. Absolutely ridiculous. They didn't understand why anyone would ever buy it. They wouldn't spend their own money on it in a million years. And then some people thought it was really cool. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, I think that I personally think that maybe this product would be useful for some large corporations or companies, um, but I can't really see it being used by anyone else. So what it is, is it's, uh, it's basically, from what we gather, unless something's changed since the article came out, uh, it's a concept for a, basically a lawnmower with specialized blades that are smaller, and so it can print, and it has a computer-aided control, so that it basically CAD designs your grass, so you can make it say words, or draw lewd gestures on your neighbor's lawn, or do something else crazy like that. Well, let's but do it. it yeah, that's, that's exactly what I would do with it. And so, yeah, it's just a way, it's like sky, it's like sky writing, but on your grass. Something that occurs to me is that although it might be a little bit of a, a one-off novelty to write things in your grass, you might be able to actually use it as just a automated lawn mower. I mean, it's like a Roomba for your lawn, basically. And so <laughs> you could just leave it out there to mow your lawn and only on occasion you would have to use it for its sort Even of lazier printing than the that's mower. Really, that's a yeah. really expensive. It is, and I, I wouldn't buy one myself. I'm just saying that is sort of there as like a, a reason you might justify buying this. I think if I were really loaded and I really didn't want to hire somebody, <laughs> that wouldn't be bad. If you were 
One of the commenters also made a really good point. Um, they didn't really touch on this in the article, but they were wondering how useful this is for a lawn that isn't completely flat mm -hmm. and, yeah. and evenly mowed. Oh, yeah. um, because the, the blades wouldn't, I mean, yeah. they wouldn't yeah. be able to detect that. Um, so buying this, when you're buying this, you're also buying into the fact that you have to keep your lawn completely flat and completely mm -hmm. evenly mowed. So I guess if you lived it. in Kansas mm -hmm. or another play in state, I don't know. I, well, like, that's also, I mean, if you, if you are a big corporation and you have that land of grass, chances are you've been upkeeping it. Right. And this is, like, meant to come in, like, in the future, like, soon. But to people who have had, like, perfectly flat, like a hill, you know where the Hollywood sign is? Mm -hmm. But if it also said Hollywood next to it, <laughs> you know, like, something, no. not, so. not that that's an idea, but that's, like, the surface we're talking about. Right. This is still basically just a 3D CAD model someone came up with. Right. As far as this article tells us, uh, I don't think they have any uh, working models or, no, be or great. even like test versions. And so I think that some of the flaws people, uh, the commenters found in this product might be fixed by features like, I, mean, I can imagine ways of solving a lot of the problems people bring up like uh, an uneven lawn. But I also think that there's a lot of problems people aren't even considering, like uh, how long is it going to take to print something? Because if its blades are really tiny and has a high resolution of printing, then that takes forever. And if it doesn't have a high resolution, it goes fast, but like your letters have to be giant. This could be a cool application for like the portable CNC world. Yeah. Thinking broader than grass, I mean, I know. Lindsay showed up about portable CNC tools, but like, um, <laughs> see. As a way, as a way of solving, because a lot of the handheld, a lot of the kind of more portable CNC tools right now, the problem is their working footprint is pretty small, mm -hmm. and so you have to physically move them around. And this would solve a lot of those problems, well, or could it, be modified in some way. The idea of it does. Unfortunately, right. making that work on a robotic level is actually pretty hard, which is why we haven't seen a lot of right. CNC machines yet. But then, what's this, this for? Like this. This would make it work on a robotic level, wouldn't it? Well, the idea of it does. No one has actually made this right. yet, and that's, that's the big catch here. So maybe in a year we'll see an update on this article, and it's we'll have some new thoughts on it. Five million dollars. One other thought. I also imagine that if you were to use this, you wouldn't really want to s sit outside with it while right. it did its printing all day. And I really wouldn't want to leave a $200 machine out on my lawn. Is it only $200? It would be like $2,000. Yeah, whatever it is. If it's only 200 <laughs> bucks, then like... Yeah. Whatever the, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to leave it out there unattended. Yeah. So it's that's probably. another thing to think I about. I mean also that would require someone to run up and catch it while the blades are spinning. So in theory you could find <laughs> you could find your what two million dollar machine with a dead body. Is there a safety mechanism if someone like falls down and sprains their ankle? I'm ankles? sure they would build one in. Oh but again, Can you imagine? they don't have any saw stop mechanisms. Wait, yet. Do grass printer saw stop? Wait, you could totally what if like Someone who's writing out letters and then just like a body like hangs off like half of the letters. This they is like gonna be featured in Bones next season. Covered yeah. with blood. That's, that's how they find the body. Okay. Okay. Maybe anyway, we get to yeah, we're gonna, we move on. we're gonna move on. Uh, so next we're gonna talk about pulling all nighters and how they may actually give you brain damage. Sleeping in isn't lazy, it's for your health. Uh, I feel very strongly <laughs> about this article. Basically the article um tells you that not sleeping is bad for your brain. Um, and it's really ironic that, for example, college students pull all-nighters all the time, and really, they're just screwing themselves for later on in life. I think it's, well, because Joe Pino's brought up the fact that, which I don't really buy, because I have pulled my share of all-nighters, that if you come in to school the day after an all-nighter, it's the equivalent like, of coming in drunk, which I've never been drunk, <laughs> but um, I, I don't really see that that's the same thing. But this is actually more specifically talking about um, how it will wreck your cognitive functions as right. you get older. It destroys neurons no. to go, like sleep deprivation, this article is saying sleep deprivation destroys neurons that like don't come back. So I, I think all of this science must be valid. I'm not going to read the studies. I trust these people. and. 
I think maybe to some extent it's going to make a few less people actually pull all-nighters, but the large majority of people that pull all-nighters anyway might see this, and if they do, they'll probably say, okay, that's great, but I really have to get this done tonight, and I'm not in a place to be worrying about my neurons 30 years from now, or even tomorrow, I just have to get this project done. So, like, it's a tough audience to make change the way that they do things. Well, I think there's also a difference between the, like, maybe 10 all-nighters that we pull in, like, within a few years of college, and then, um, versus people who I know who will stay up till 4 in the morning because they need to finish their World of Warcraft level. It's like, okay, for your health, you should go to sleep. This is for everyone at CMU. Like, <laughs> let's be real here. Sleep. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, like, if you can't, like, it's an, if you can choose, and also this is like, this is a much longer term. So if you're pulling like once a week, like, you're going you're gonna to wreck something up there. Yeah. But also, like, the article mentions new parents and, like, mm -hmm. and, you know, babies wake up all the time, all night, always. And so, I don't know, I feel like evolutionarily, if this was really, really so detrimental, maybe people are just living so much longer now that we're just starting to notice the effects, but I don't know, if, if it was really detrimental, evolution would have like made babies not wake up in the middle of the night. Evolution is still working on it. And right. another thing is that people didn't need to use their brains nearly as much as we do these days. Not because they didn't have awesome brains, their brains were basically identical uh, for many hundreds right. of thousands of years. Um, okay, don't quote me on that. Um, but I think we just use our brains in right. everyday life so much more these days that maybe we're noticing it because so many of our industries are uh, purely thought based. Yeah, also, we're like taking time to study it. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. I think that something else to consider with this is that um, our generation ha is becoming a lot more intense in regards to um, our work ethics. And so, like, for example, I think that the culture in colleges have changed a lot um, over the years. And now p I think more people are pulling all nighters all the time. Mm -hmm. Not even, it may not even be for work purposes, but at least at CMU, that's what it is. Um, Sometimes. Primarily. Sometimes it's not, though. Yeah, but, but like my point is that um, if we are taking on these practices at a young age, I think that it's going to stick more. Um, and that's really bad because if we start not sleeping from the time when we're 17 or 18, that's going to continue for who knows how long in our crazy busy jobs. Um, and those effects I think we will see because the body is meant to sleep. Something that I think Joe Pino mentioned in our meta skills class last year was that occasionally people will bring up the fact that they are uh, pulling all nighters as a point of pride. They'll say, "Oh, I pulled yeah. all nighter. I oh, I've only had two hours of sleep over the last four days," and and everyone's supposed to respect them for that. And oftentimes they do. And I think that's a little worrying because that is probably always going to be a stronger motivator than having read this article telling you about your neurons. So that kind of worries me. Yeah, and I think that we're definitely seeing that now. Uh, maybe maybe not specifically in our industry, but I know for like the banking industry, um, if, you, if you go out of college and you work for a big bank, um, your first two years working for that bank, are, you're going to be pulling like 80 hour weeks. Right, yeah. And like, so that's not, that's not even, that's encouraging you and requiring you Right. to pull late hours with not a lot of sleep. I mean, I think it's, regardless of what science says, the fact that it feels like, at least to me, all-nighters are becoming a point of pride has a larger implication on like stress culture in general that is just not good. And, uh, I think that, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. I mean, because you're saying like the, the like, college culture is changing. And again, everything is just becoming way more competitive. Mm -hmm. We're constantly trying to one up each other, like one up ourselves. So it's like, oh my God, this like so. I know during Olivia Snow's last semester, like my my last project got to be this one has to get a like I have to do better than the last one, and I have to do better than the last one. So that's taking more time to dedicate to things, and it's sort of not instead of prioritizing like okay, 
tonight I'm going to spend time doing this and then tomorrow I'll be able to work on whatever. It's I need to get it all done tonight so that I can keep working on it every mm -hmm. single night, like every single hour of every single day. There's also just more distractions in our lives now. I mean, yeah. like, I almost wish we were in an age where email was the primary distract. We had a, like, a PRM class last week about email and how to limit the distraction of email. And I'm thinking about how like email is the least distracting form of interaction with the world yeah. that I have in my yeah. life. Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing is, is I think I think almost all of us, and it's and it sounded like almost all of the commenters on the article, we all agree that this article is right. We should be sleeping more. There shouldn't be a a culture where uh, you have pride in not sleeping and pulling all nighters. But now the question is, how do we? Fix it. How do we how do we fix it? Because everyone is still doing it. Right. So I think it's really easy to put the blame on the culture here, and maybe it deserves that blame. But as an individual, you completely have the power to not have those distractions and not stay up all night. It doesn't matter what the culture says you should do. Like you can just not stay up all night. That's your choice. Right. Uh, and so if it matters to you, you can solve that for you. It's a lot harder to solve it for the entire culture and for everybody. Yeah. Well, it's also going back to it's what are your priorities mm -hmm. and like your time management skills is also something. So I know I haven't been able my time management skills have been really on it this semester. Thank you. And <laughs> um, but I so I haven't really been have to pull any like maybe like one when Excel crashed. But um, but yeah, so I think it's all just how you're you really have to decide how you're gonna treat yourself, how you're gonna handle your life. Yeah. Um, which is kind of which is kind of a lot to think about actually. So now we all just need to do that. Right. Um, all right, so let's move mm -hmm. on. Uh, next we're going to talk about the article, Teller Wins Lawsuit Over Copied Magic Trick Performance. Um, should we explain the problem? Yes, we should. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, somebody tell her what's the name? So Penn and Teller have the, or I think Teller in particular, which I guess is the short guy who doesn't talk of the Penn and Teller duo, am I correct there? I believe so. Yeah. I think he's the short guy that doesn't talk because Penn made all the comments in this article, which is super funny. Um, so there's this act which basically involves a rose on a pedestal and a light that shines and projects the rose's shadow on a white screen. And so then the act involves Teller cutting the shadow of the rose on the screen and then the actual part of the actual rose falls at the same time. So that's the premise really cool. of the trick. And so I guess this uh, European Belgian. Belgian magician, whose last name is D-O-G-G-E, I don't really know how that's pronounced. Doge? Dodge? Dodge. Dodge. Okay. That guy. Dodge. I think it's Dodge, yeah. He put this video out on YouTube called, that basically was like, I've explained how to do Penn and Teller's magical rose trick thing. And, um, the YouTube video showed him doing it, and then also said, if you pay me three grand, I'll show you how. Mm -hmm. And so then, Penn and Teller sued him for copyright infringement, because Teller had actually registered this trick um, with the copyright office in like the 80s. And so the discussion is basically, you cannot copyright magic tricks, but you can copyright pantomime. And so the case has been, whether it's magic or whether it's pantomime, and the judge said, Basically, that while magic tricks cannot be copyrighted, this is pant this particular trick is pantomime, and yeah, yeah. So and he had it copyrighted. So right. he did have it. My question is, why can't you copyright a magic trick? To me, a magic trick is basically just a combination of choreography and dialogue, and you can copyright both of those things. So why can't you copyright a magic trick? I think well, I'll th I think that's a Good, like that's a really good point, and especially for stuff that's rare like this that really no one else in the world before this was doing. Um, and also, like I think that magic tricks that require a certain amount of engineering, which I'm assuming this one does, like in some fashion, mm -hmm. should be able to be copyrighted because that's basically a machine that you're making. Well, the you article know, like, did discuss like how you can patent um, the engineering of right. a trick, like you can patent the pieces that you use to do the trick. But the problem is, is that that patent is public. Anyone right. can see it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But still, no one can steal it. Yeah, so but I still think that the trick itself should be copyrightable. I don't know. 
I tend to take a more liberal view of copyright law and that I kind of wish that fewer things were copyrighted so that fewer things would like feel obligated to be copyrighted. Uh, can't we all just get along? Like I know we can't, but I, I wonder, well like pulling a rabbit out of a hat, if someone copyrights that, then does that mean that like every poor dude who like does ma magic tricks at kids' birthday parties can no longer do without like citing it? Saying that, like, that doesn't, like, that's an old, I'm saying, like, tricks that require, like, new, like, someone alive today, like, a pen and teller, come up with a trick that has to be, like, engineered and all that stuff, um, they should be able to have that fully copyrighted, like, across so the board. So enforce some but kind somebody, of public domain of, like, you know how, yeah. where, so like, this is, like, someone, like, like, Mickey Mouse should no longer be copyrighted because right. he's not alive. So, I mean, like, that's sort of, and it's been so a long time. So let I mean, me pose a hypothetical question to you. Let's say I come up with a magic trick where, let's say I disappear, and then reappear over there. And then you come up with a magic trick. Maybe you've okay. seen mine where you disappear over there and you appear over there. You've done it in a totally different way than mine, and maybe you didn't even know how I did mine. If I've copyrighted my trick, and because of secrecy, and I don't want to tell everyone how it works, I've copyrighted just the idea of disappearing one place and appearing in another place. You can't do your trick even though you've come up with a brilliant engineering design that works entirely differently. And you can't well, copyright ideas. You well, the thing is, no, but like you can copyright well, creation, comes, but you can't cool. copyright like... Yeah. Well, the thing is with that, it says in the article that the Belgian, yeah, the Belgian. The Belgian um, guy, Dodge, um, the caption for the video was, if you've seen Penn and Teller, yeah. this is this Sure, is it. And, and, and I completely agree that, yeah. that this guy was really stealing yeah. their idea. My point is that it's not a really easy thing to just say we should or should not copy, be able to copyright magic right. tricks because there's a lot of um, elements to a magic trick. There's the outward appearance, but there's also the inner workings, and a lot of that has to be secret, and a lot of that oh. has to be very public. But the thing that, the reason the judge sided with Penn and Teller was mm -hmm. that... It was the mind. Well, no, it was that, because uh, that was the Belgian guy's defense. The Belgian guy was like, yeah, but like it looks the same, but I'm doing it in a different way. So the reason the judge sided with Penn and Teller was because it looked the same. Mm -hmm. And also because he said, like, this is Penn and Teller's rose trick. Yeah, yeah. But, and so, if we go by the rules that you were just saying, then Penn and Teller shouldn't have won. My point is not that this different. is a wrong, uh, like, the judge made the wrong choice. My right. point is that it's a complicated topic, sure. and it's hard to just say there's one answer for all of the magic tricks. Right. And we do have to get into the right. specifics of every magic trick. And I think that's part of why copyright law in general is such a foggy and undefined thing, is because any blanket statement is going to be very unfair, clearly unfair, to a lot I, of people. Yeah, yeah. I think that it should be very specific. Like, if someone wants to copyright something like that, they should. It should get very technical and very specific. Like, okay, what part of it do you want to copyright? Like, like, well, so for I example, do. something like reappearing and disappearing one place, reappearing another. So it's like they go and if someone makes that, and it's like I want to go copyright this. Then it should be taken into consideration. Like, okay, this has been done by many other people before. It's not like so basically. It should be like put under close speculation, and I agree. And because of that, I think that less things should be copyrighted. So, like, I think that what is copyright should be taken like very, like, not like pretty literally, because <laughs> this is like exactly what very specific, very like, literal. Um, and so, it's not just like this general thing should be copyrighted so that no one else can have this idea. I guess. Maybe that looks like it. I'm yes. I guess. My larger question is whether copyright, whether the copyright office and copyright laws should be the be-all and end-all enforcement of intellectual property rights. Because that's how it is right now. Well, but there are a lot of... Well, what, do you, what else would you propose? I don't know. I guess, I'm, I guess that's the question. I don't really have another solution. But, I mean, I know they, the article was talking about how, like, magician groups and magician organizations, I don't think they have their own union, but, you know, people who, like the Magicians Association of America or whoever, was uh, said that 
traditionally this is handled in house and so then all the magicians are like you suck we're never going to work with you again and we're going to tell everyone we know to never work with you mm -hmm. and so the offending magician is blackballed forever but Penn and Teller like went and got the copyright people involved and so well what I mean that's also would be hard it'd be harder for them to shun a magician of, like on the other not in our continent I guess. That's also, part of it. also, they're they're out to make money. Yeah. Right. Like, let's be real. Like, I mean, there's I think, some big right. guys making some pretty big money. Yeah, and they went through. Money. They well, went through like a lot to get this guy in court yeah. too. And but. I'm sure part of why they won is because they had ton more money. Well, and also the Belgian. I mean, the Belgian guy was like, "If you give me three grand, I'll tell you how right. I did it," That's which is like, like against the magician's code or whatever. Yeah. Um, and just so, like and just, really be, and just be and just be like. like yeah. Yeah. So like clearly he probably didn't like he was taking a risk that he didn't probably care too much about, I'm guessing, of being like, Oh, you guys are gonna shun me in America, like I ain't good for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Anyone who's really interested in this topic should watch the film The Prestige. Uh <laughs> It's really good. I watched it a few weeks ago, and it deals specifically with about magicians who are stealing each other's tricks. Uh -huh. um, and and there's a back and forth feud there, and it, it doesn't get into copyright because it's a film that is set before copyrights were what they are today. But it definitely makes you think about similar topics. So cool. If you are into that, great. So next we're going to talk about uh, drama matters: the rise of the abstract set. Uh, so this was the article that was talking about that one play with the bikes, um, and the play was sort of about, the message was about global warming. Um, that bike play. <laughs> the bike play. Um, That's but not its actual title. The uh, more broad topic of the article was just about abstract sets and the role that they play, literally, in uh, drama today. Just to clear it up, it's called lungs. Is oh, sorry, and not the bike play. Just so everybody knows. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I. Yeah, I really. I'm so traditional for some reason about this. Um, I'm like way into abstract sets. Don't get me wrong, but I, I feel like people are afraid to go traditional nowadays. Like with our box set, we're like, oh my god, it's like the first box set that we've done. It's like this is a traditional like thing, and it's a shame that. I don't know, it's being lost because everyone wants to be abstract. That is yeah. so the new thing to be just because. Not for particularly it's gonna like enhance the show, but because I'm artsy and like I need to like I need to be abstract and I need to express things. I need to and it's like, well design for this design for the show, not for the sake of being abstract. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think that uh, perhaps Carnegie Mellon uh, is more abstract than traditional, and that's why we may feel that way. Um, I think outside of this place, uh, maybe there are some places that are like still very traditional. Um, but the point that I totally agree with is that I think that I'm all for abstract sets or designs in general, um, but I don't think they're great when they don't have a point. So in this particular case, um, I thought it was done really well because they were on bikes and they were producing power um, and the play was about global warming and it, it makes sense. It has yeah. a connection to what the play is trying to say. Um, if this was like Hamlet and they were riding bikes the whole time, I don't know if I would get it. So um, uh, there's a comment that I'd like to share. Um, I won't read it word for word, but generally speaking, uh, this commenter quotes Joe Pino, uh, and something Joe Pino says is that he doesn't understand how theater gets away with what it does, or the art world in general, actually. Um, if a DJ were to play a song that was just a bunch of random noises, and then at the end of the song he said, oh, and if you read the thesis that the artist made for this, you'll understand what it was all about, and it all makes sense. Uh, and what both this commenter and Joe Pino are pointing out is that it, the intention has to come across to the audience, and if it doesn't, then you're really not providing anything meaningful to that audience member. Maybe you had a great time making it, but what's the point of sharing it if they're not going to understand it? Um, and I think that that is something that a lot of designers, especially here at CMU, fall into. They are so caught up in the ideas that only they know that they don't actually convey those ideas. Mm -hmm. And as designers, I think that is really our job to convey those ideas, not just have them. Uh, 
And I don't necessarily think that's an argument against abstract set no, so not. much as an argument for not doing self-indulgent art. Yeah, you have to do Which it well. Is like the kind of the same thing with the special effects and the babies on stage. I mean, ultimately, I think all of us feel and the frustration we all sometimes have in an environment that's like always push the envelope, always is that theater at its heart is about the people watching it, and it. I mean, it's also about the process and making and doing something great that no one's ever done before, but. I think sometimes we tend to fall into a trap of it's all about us, the artists, and forget that the people we are doing this as a not as a service, but for the people who are watching, who are coming to sit in seats and watch and like feel something. And so, if it's I don't I don't know if it's necessarily an argument for or against abstraction or traditional box sets, mm -hmm. but. Because I I've seen shows with box sets that I'm like wow there's this set has absolutely the designer totally checked out and the set has nothing to do with this people yeah. at all but I just sometimes I my, the frustration I sometimes feel here and also in the world is that it's not just about us you know. I mean, it's not about, I really want to use purple, so I'm going to make purple light. Or I really want this to be steampunk, so I'm going to make it steampunk. It, it's about the story and c conveying that story to the best that it could be. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. step off my, like, I, I agree with that. I think that um, what you're saying with conveying to the audience, um, I think, yeah, it depends on where you are. So if you're in a place where... Uh, your audience is really used to traditional uh, designs, you're going to give them more traditional designs. However, personally, what I love about abstract sets is I feel like they make you think more. Um, and lots, I mean, a lot of people go to the theater not to have to think that hard, but I, I don't really agree with that. I think that theater should make you think. Um, and. I think now we are in a place where even the most traditional places um, are starting to add a little bit of abstract mm -hmm. sure, elements, yeah, totally. um, which, I, which I'm interested in. I'm interested in how their audiences are reacting to that. Um, and I think that it's a great thing that mm -hmm. we're headed in that direction. Something that a friend recently brought up with me was the idea that this is a challenge that theater faces, but it's not a challenge that a lot of other similar art forms are dealing with. So for example, film doesn't have the conversation about should we have an abstract set for this one or a realistic one. It's basically always going to be a, a space that feels about right. Now, before everyone gets mad, I know that there are many films that have abstract <laughs> sets. I've seen them and I actually really enjoy them. But my point is it's not nearly the conversation that it is in theater. Um, and I think that it's a Thing that could really be paralleled over, and I'm not sure why we have this as such a, a standout point in the theater world right now, mm. as compared to other industries. I mean, I just think there's 20 movies that every single person in the country sees a year. Maybe not 20, and not everybody, but like, there, there's a very tiny, tiny percentage of films that are said to represent, uh, that films made, or even films made in America, that is actually considered telling this representative of all of American film. So, what do you, I, I mean, just like, just, just that it's possible that in theater, it's way less universal because you cannot physically have, except for tours, you cannot physically have the same production in more than one place at the same time. And so you're, you're. It's not as widely seen. Right. So even like the Book of Mormon on Broadway or other show, Phantom of the Opera on Broadway, there's a much smaller percentage of shows that everyone has seen or everyone has seen that is considered representative of theater as a whole because people are much more likely to go see their local company's pr like production of Our Town versus, you know, yeah, everyone's seen that, that film, maybe film doesn't have that conversation because Film isn't because the average film goer isn't seeing 
the what is isn't the theater goer. Well, no, the average the average film goer is seeing the same set of films in Iowa as they are in Maine. Whereas the average theater oh, goer yeah. yeah, sorry, that okay. took like no, a long I, I totally got you. I got you. Yeah. Whereas the average theater goer in both those places are seeing completely different things. Mm -hmm. And so then as people move and as culture and yeah. as the internet comes around and all that other crap that globalization is doing, it's more of a conversation because our our culture, our national conscience, consciousness of theater is way more varied than mm -hmm. our national yeah. consciousness of film. Yeah, yeah I, I think that that's a really interesting point, and I think it's going to come up again in like one of the next couple of articles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. We'll talk uh, about yeah so next we're going to talk about um, the article titled, They Cast Whom? Actor Choices to Offend Every Racial Sensibility. <laughs> Can I just say, oh, sorry, can I just say that this article started out with a little video, if you haven't read the article, it starts out with a little video from Peter, from the Disney version of Peter Pan of the scene um, where it's they the What sing, Makes the Red Man Red song, which, which I never took as being someone quite as white as I am, never took it to be something like that, and I, after reading the article and seeing the video, go back and actually watch the, like, a YouTube clip of the video, and, like, I mean, I think it's funny because I'm like sick, but like, <laughs> um, I think it's like really just like wow. <laughs> yeah. And the stage, wow. the stage, the stage version of the dialogue is like equally offensive, but a little less blatant. Yeah. So They're like not straight up. Let's right, summarize right. the article a little bit overall. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so basically, this article was going through a bunch of examples um, of casting that have offended some race. So, and it was a different race for each example. Well, and it's also just that, like, a lot of, a, there are several, it's basically saying there are several archetypes of racially offensive casting. There's, like, the white person cast as a character that should be a minority, which is the Peter Pan example. Ro Rooney Mara was cast, who's very white, was cast as Tiger Lily, who is Native American, as it is written, but she's called an Indian princess, and like, and that's where the what makes the red man red and ugga wug, where if it's actually cast as it, there's no way to win when you're doing Peter Pan because if you <laughs> cast a Native American as Tiger Lily, then like it's it's still an incredibly offensive <laughs> character. And so I actually commented on this article or a different one about Rooney Mara and said I want to see like a like an Indian from India cast as Tiger Lily because. If she's an Indian princess, that maybe does the best job of not mm. yeah. I mean, being drastically also offensive, like, but maybe not. I'm also, sure where are you going to find, like, I mean, I'm sure that there are, but very well known, like, good resume, good actress for Broadway, who's Native American, like, just like someone who fits exactly what the director wants, right. and then like, I'm sure they don't come across many Native Americans right now. But it's I like, think that's not an excuse, yeah. but I'm saying that's one reason why they should not, like, and also, like, if they say, all right, we will find, like, and if they want a Native American, this, they're like, we will only take Native Americans. It's like, okay, there are people who would want to play that role. Like, one of the examples is Aladdin. And a white guy, right? Is no, Aladdin, the, the thing, the so the trope that, the archetype that Aladdin, the guy, the guy who's playing Aladdin on Broadway right now is that none of the cast in Aladdin is, middle, is of Middle Eastern descent. And the guy who plays Aladdin is like Portuguese and Jewish, Jewish not and, Portuguese. not Portuguese, sorry. He's yeah. Jewish, Russian, Dutch, Polish, and Filipino. Right. right. <laughs> so... Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, <laughs> Carolyn Mazuka made a really good point about this, um, and she said that uh, she doesn't necessarily agree that race and ethnicity should be such a big factor because um, she says uh, the natives in Peter Pan are completely different than actual natives were, so much so that one could argue that the portrayal itself is offensive. And I totally yeah. agree with that point. I think that perhaps in films or uh, plays that um, where you can accurately represent yeah. the race, right. you should. You should cast someone that is of, a, of that race. However, in a case where Disney they're not going to be doing that, then yeah. what's the point? Yeah. I mean, like, also, well, these are all derived from Disney. I don't know 
if it's all in from anime. I mean, I don't know if it's a what's the point, though. I guess my problem, there were also a lot of comments that were like, why is race such a big deal? And I agree that in a, that it shouldn't be a big deal. We shouldn't have to have this conversation. But until a non-identified racial caste involves people of a wide variety of ethnicities, we do have to have this conversation. Because right now, an unidentified racial caste is almost all white people with your token black guy and your sexy Latino woman. And that's not, that shouldn't be okay. So there's a, two different words or whatever um, that they have to talk about this in the theater world. And I think the term is uh, racial conscious, but it might be color conscious and uh, it's racially, conscious. racially conscious. And then the alternative version of thinking about it is blind as opposed to conscious. And the idea is that maybe when you cast a show, you should just not think about what race anyone is in the play and anyone is in the um, in real life. And some people subscribe to that and they think that's the way to go with every play. Other people have the idea that you should think about it, but that shouldn't be the deciding factor. If the play mandates it and it would completely change the meaning of that play, then you should take that into consideration. And if it doesn't, then it absolutely doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, and some people feel like you need to choose the yeah. smart choice for that mm -hmm. uh, production. And I think that that's a pretty smart way to go. Uh, give yeah. yourself the flexibility, but I think the tricky part is that everybody needs to give yeah. each other that flexibility as well and understand that other people have a lot that they need to balance when they're casting a show. And I'm sure that there are going to be situations where people get cast completely wrong for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think that the best thing to do, instead of getting offended by it and, and really having a, a personal problem with it, is just try to make the situation better. Let your thoughts be known, but not in a in a really horrible way that makes you look bad because that's just going to hurt your cause and in the future you're going to be less likely to get yeah. the sort of casting you're looking for. But yeah. my like my problem I guess my problem is that when people aren't thinking about race they're thinking about white people. Be I think depends who you are. Well, right, but you mean, you in the me or? in the media today, I mean, I think it would be remiss of us to say we're post racial or post prejudice. Yeah, and so, when you think of, like, when you're not thinking about someone is a, the, the phrase minority, when talking about race, in and of itself, makes it such that colorblind casting tends to whitewash stages. Yeah. And it has for decades. And it has for, like, hundreds of years. And so, I think until... The term colorblind means more than just not pretending we're not a, pretending we're not whitewashing the cast. We have to have this conversation. Yeah, I think you made a good point. I like the point that like the director should be conscious, but uh, like be aware that like this person is like African American, this person is Latino, but that should not be like a determining factor, or that should not be the only thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that, because, I mean, I've seen shows that were cast just so badly, but just, just because of race, where it was just so distracting, be like, how are you, like, there was an uh, African-American woman who was married to a white guy in a time where they had slaves, and you're like, what? <laughs> so it's like, at that point, you're yeah. just like, so if it's a I, story, yeah, I have seen many plays that do that sort of yeah. thing, or a play where somebody will have, two, two people will have a child that has a race that they really couldn't have, yeah. um, <laughs> genetically speaking, and that sort of thing doesn't end up bothering me at all. Even historical issues don't bother me unless the play is about that historical issue. If it's about a play where it's saying these two races are not getting along and one is uh, controlling the other and not allowing them to intermarry, then it wouldn't make a lot of sense, and that would distract from and I think the idea behind um, racially conscious casting is that you only choose based on race when it's a play that really demands it, as opposed to a play that kind of, okay, sure, but our audience in the modern day is totally able to get past it, then you, you get past it. Yeah, I don't know. I just... Also about the director. Yeah. I'm going to stop us here sure. because we... Yeah, yeah, running out of time. We've got to wrap up here. Um, okay, so the next article we're going to talk about is the importance of studying theater history. Um, 
<laughs> Lindsay feels very passionate I about this one, so I'm going to let her take it. Okay, <laughs> so this article is basically giving a list of reasons why we should study theater history other than what they consider a cliche that you have to know the rules before you break them. Um, and it made some really interesting points that I hadn't really thought about before. Um, first of all, I don't think it's a cliche that you have to know the rules before you break them because no one wants to be that asshole in a production meeting that's like, I thought of this really great idea. What if we did each? What if we did the each scene of the play in a different room, and you uh, and you have to be the jerk who's like, dude, like Fefu and Friends did that like year did that like in the sixties or seventies or whatever. So I don't think that's a cliche. But more importantly, um, it talked a lot about how we as practitioners have kind of a common vocabulary of plays and of shows that we all are aware enough about to use as examples for like Hamlet if you like I want I want this to be like the end is, the ending scene in Hamlet means like this is going to be a freaking bloodbath and everyone's going to die mm -hmm. or like waiting for Godot or other classic pieces that we as practitioners use to mean other things yeah so I think that that's a really strong argument for why we need to study theater history but at the same time, it has some flaws. So like you were saying before, uh, when we were talking about one of the other articles, we haven't all seen the same plays, and realistically there isn't a good way for us all to see the same productions. So we may have all seen Hamlet, but the Hamlet we saw is not the same as the Hamlet other people saw. And so, it's hard to say, I want this to be like Hamlet, because my idea about that is going to be very different from other people. And so, it's a limited sort of language that we're able to communicate with. There's a lot we can say to each other, but there's a lot we can't. And it's important that we understand those barriers so that we're not trying to communicate something that really can't be communicated that way. Well, I think that's also a little bit the difference between being able to analyze a script and right. analyze a story exactly. and the difference between just knowing some theater history. Right. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I know some theater history, but I definitely don't know as much as I should. And I've, I've felt this uh, this feeling that you have described here like firsthand. So in class, I know you guys have probably felt the same way. Sometimes our teachers are like, oh, so they make a reference to some movie or some book yes. or, or, or something in theater. Don't and if movies. you don't know it, they're like, oh, you have to know that. And if we're experiencing that now in school, we're totally going to experience that when we're out working. And if you do know that theater history, it's not only a common vocabulary, but it's something that um, you almost bond over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I th yeah, and I think that's what I think you were talking about, which being able to like reference um, shows for other people. It's as the article mentions, we're all we're in the same business, and we should try and have the same uh, language, like yeah. not exactly or the same, a common just language. Like, yeah, like it's sort of like a common way that we can. It says like a common way that we can which is, I think is a really great um, way of putting it. Yeah. So I think that that's really important. Not necessarily have being able to say the ending of this play, that's how like this, just like being very specific well, about a part of the Sometimes that can be really helpful. So for example, yeah, I can say, I need a narrator character like in Our Town. Right. And that's pretty clear because you've seen yeah. Our Town and you right. know what that means. And that's probably the best way to describe that sort of character. I mean, I can reference like, uh, a Wes Anderson film at you that does a similar thing, but you're yeah. not necessarily going to know that because it's so much more removed from what we right. do on a daily basis. Right. And so the language really has a lot of power to be uh, very precise, but also really general. And we just have to know how to use it well. Right. But that does yeah. start with learning the history right. in the first place. I mean, the other thing is there's a, there are a lot of techniques. I think this mm -hmm. is a little bit more in the actor world, but like the Stanislav, the Stanislavski method and a lot of things that if you it's that are on your resume as an actor and that have a cert, that have a weight. Like mm -hmm. here at CMU, we use the Stanislavski method a lot. I guess I'm not really sure. This is again something I need to read up more on and be more aware of. But yeah. we all use, you know, words that are completely arbitrary to anyone else, but should have meaning mm -hmm. to us. 
Yeah. And so I think I think some of this too is admitting when you don't know something. Yeah. I think here we're it's really <laughs> hard for us to not to be like I don't know I have no idea what you're talking about right now. Like I should I should know what the Stanislavski method, but like he was a dude that I guess was Russian. Like, yeah. yeah. And I think another point is is that we learn from the things that we've done in the past. Right. So that's just like, right there, that's an important reason to know your theater history. Right. Yeah, and it's also important that we learn from each other, even just modern day things, but also going back in history. And so if only, I, if I only ever learned from plays that I was personally involved with, I'm gonna be a much worse theater artist. Yeah, right. So exactly. it's yeah. really important that I learn about other people's theater, and that's basically theater history. Yeah, I totally agree. Great. Right. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to our last article here. Uh, titled Fluke Issue Statement Regarding Spark Funds Impounded Multimeters. That's just such a good title. Yeah. <laughs> Award it, goes to these it folks. Pulls you in. Good job. <laughs> Hackaday. Um, who wants to speak first? Here, I'll, um, I'll try it. Can I? <laughs> um, I did read that, sorry. Uh, so it's these basically um, uh, an item or a multimeter. A multimeter. Um, was recalled, right? Or well, like it was production was shut down. Because yeah, yeah. Of, because of copyright issues. Yeah. Yeah. Trademark. Trademark. But yeah, yeah. when yeah. it's not in trademark issues. issues. It's trademark. So yeah, that's yeah. And so basically, um, the government confiscated these uh, multimeters through customs because of their yeah. They shipped a they seized a shipment of 2,000 multimeters because of trademark issues. Yeah, and basically so, like, the article is just like, this sucks. Well, and <laughs> also, the, th the thing was also that the company that made them and like violated the trade. Look, so for, I think a couple of things were that, A, the multimeter got all the way through production and was in shipment before someone was like, yeah. no, and seized it at like the airport, basically, yeah. or at the port. And then uh, the other thing was Fluke, the company that makes them, issued a statement and basically was like, sorry guys, it, you know, this, this, this sucks and we're going to try and do better. Um, yeah, and something, so, but something obviously went wrong here in their organization. Right. Like, it, uh, this kind of just shows you how important it is to not ignore these things. <laughs> well, well, and it's not research. Well, yeah, I'm just yeah. going to ignore it. Yeah, well, 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 just to make sure that you're doing down. these things right, because yeah. the law is the law, and... Well, and it's also... You, the article right. also talks a little bit about how the enforcement, or how the enforcement was a little bit of a problem, because... They don't, I mean, clearly things get through customs all the time with trademark violations. And so, and like some companies don't care and some companies do. So from what I understand, which is like, um, the question, the question is, and the reason this is worth like writing an article about is larger than just these people should have done their research and not trademark, but it's also a little bit about how writing a trademark, because everyone wants to write a trademark for like everything, like the saw stop guy wants to write the trademark for any saw stopping technology ever. And that's a bigger conversation about how broad our trademarks should be, like how broad we should allow people so, to write their trademarks. Something that the article brings up, and I think this is perhaps the most interesting element of this relatively short article, is that you don't get to have a trademark and enforce it sometimes. You have to enforce it all the time or none of the time. Right. But you don't get to say, these guys can use it because they're a nice nonprofit and I like them. And these guys can't because they're a big evil corporation. Yeah. And so you can. Well, according to the article, you can't. Or you I, shouldn't. I, uh, no, it's a legal thing. Once you start doing that, you lose your copyright yeah. ability. Yeah, gotcha. that's true. Um, okay. And, and that's a bit of an issue for a lot of people because sometimes they have some great idea and they want to make sure everyone who deserves to be using it for free can. And trademark isn't usually the right way to go for them, but it's tempting and sometimes they make that choice. Right. Uh, and I think that that's really problematic and there's a lot of people who don't quite understand how trademarks work who end up having to deal with them anyway. Sure. And that leads to a lot of problems. Uh, and although I don't think that's probably what happened with Fluke because yeah, they're a pretty big company, I think that that is a more relevant 
topic to theater because yeah. we right. tend to be a little smaller scale. Um, obviously, this wasn't a problem that just happened one place. Um, this is probably a problem that happened into, uh, yeah. again and again, and no one yeah. decided to stop this before it got out of hand. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, in this case, it, just, just it like, went on too far. Yeah. yeah. So. It's, it's a little mind-boggling that it made it all the yeah. way to the ship. Because like, people yeah. had to Customs. order them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, from what I understand, these are fairly fancy multimeters, yeah. and so 2,000 of them is a pretty big loss, I imagine. Yeah. Right. I don't know how big it is, but I, they're a name I've heard of, so I imagine yeah. that's a pretty bad right. thing for yeah. the management. Yeah. Somebody's losing some jobs over yes. that. Yeah. So that, that does suck, like they say. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. uh, so... We're ending on kind of a down, down note, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching this week, and okay. yeah. Yeah. tune back in next time. Yeah, maybe a will do it next time. Hey. <laughs> I have some good comments.